centered in the arts while deeply engaged in science and technology. Through our course offerings and creative research work, we are training designers, scientists, artists, engineers, and performers in the practices and application of animation, information visualization, real-time virtual environments, motion capture, and mediated performance design. Kara Malik, our speaker today, is a prime example of the necessity of both science and art in bringing stories and characters alive through computer animation. Kara graduated with her MFA in design from OSU in 2006, so she's one of our own. After completing her MFA in design, Kara, I mean while completing her MFA in design, Kara was also a mentor in a summer program we have called Digital Animation, a technology mentoring program for young women. After the completion of her degree, Kara was recruited by DreamWorks and built a successful career in an area of computer animation called rigging. This area is a wonderful combination of art and science, bringing characters to life and calling on knowledge of anatomy, computer science, sculpture, aesthetics, and usability. Kara supervised DreamWorks' character technology team, directing rigging studio production. Her credits include How to Train Your Dragon 1 and 2, Trolls, and Kung Fu Panda 2 and 3. This past summer, Kara continued to give back when she generously gathered a group of women professionals working at DreamWorks and video conference with our summer program, offering career advice and a glimpse into the work that they do with the 8th and 7th and 8th graders who were part of our summer program. So I'm really happy to welcome Kara back to OSU to our campus as she answers the question, what does it take for an animated dragon to fly? All right. Let's get this up here. Mm -hmm. Great, all right, well, hi everybody. I'm so excited to be here. My name is Kara, and I'm the supervisor of character technology at DreamWorks Animation. So uh, before I get into the details of what rigging is and how it works, let me tell you a little bit about myself and how I got to where I am today. Um, growing up, I was obsessed with drawing and animation in movies. Um, I borrowed my mom's video camera and made that lovely stop motion piece you'll see there. Um, <laughs> And I saw every Disney movie that came out five, six, seven times, practiced drawing all the characters. I loved it. Um, at the same time, I was really into math and science. Um, and computers were just starting to be a thing when I was a kid. So I, I really liked both kind of artistic and technical things. And I was trying to find a way to kind of merge those two together into something that I could do as a career. Um, so lo and behold, in 1995, this movie came out called Toy Story. I'm sure some of you have seen it. Um, and that was really this eureka moment for me. It was a way to combine all of my interests into one 
potential career. I had no idea what kind of jobs there were in computer animation at the time, but uh, I knew that that was where I wanted to be, and so that's what I focused on when I started going into college. Um, so for my undergrad degree, I went to the University of Florida. Um, they were piloting a new program there called Digital Arts and Sciences, and I got a Bachelor of Science from their College of Engineering in this new Digital Arts program. Um, my dad is a civil engineer, so he loved the College of Engineering part of that <laughs> process. Um, and then I came here to ACAD, and I got an MFA in design um, from Ohio State. Uh, the thing, looking back on it now, that I think was actually the most beneficial coming out of both of these programs at UF and OSU, um, they were both really interdisciplinary programs. So they combined students from computer science and art and dance and theater and people that think really differently. Because while you know learning the software and learning the, the animation process is important, um, that got, my, got me my first job and got my foot in the door. But I think what really um, helped me in my career to kind of move up at DreamWorks was the ability to communicate across these boundaries, these right brain, left brain boundaries. Because um, I'll find myself kind of sitting in a conference room with a bunch of um, computer programmers and a bunch of artists and I can see how they're just not quite getting their points across and I can kind of take a step back and translate from one side to the other. I feel comfortable talking in both technical terms and also drawing on whiteboards to kind of help explain what it is that I'm trying to trying to convey. So um, overall I think that was a really really important thing that I got out of both of these programs that has really helped me in my career. So while I was at ACAD here, um, DreamWorks Animation came to teach a master class in animation. Um, they sent out a different artist every week to teach us a different part of the animation process. And that was huge, both because it led to me getting an internship there, um, but that's also where I first discovered rigging and discovered that that was what I was most passionate about. Um, I was in the computer lab until two in the morning trying to get my rig working just right before the next day's class. Um, and yeah, so that's where I kind of fell in love with rigging. But before I can really explain what rigging is, well, first of all, let me talk a little bit about what I did at DreamWorks. So um, I've been at DreamWorks for 10 years. Um, the first uh, thing I ever rigged at DreamWorks was those lovely little uh, penguin hats you see there from Madagascar 2, those very clever disguises. Um, I worked on How to Train Your Dragon, um, Megamind, How to Train Your Dragon 2, Kung Fu Panda 3. Um, I moved into a technology team that now works on all of the films at the studio. Um, we've worked on Trolls and Boss Baby and we're working on How to Train Your Dragon 3. Um, but uh, first let me give you some context about the animation process so you can understand where rigging fits in. So computer animation is pretty complicated and it requires many steps. Um, at a big studio, it's not practical for every artist to become an expert at every part of the process. There's just too much to learn, and we have a really, really high bar for, for quality and aesthetics. We want our movies to look just perfect. So instead, um, the artists specialize in a different, you know, in different areas of the process, and it kind of runs like an assembly line. This is kind of a simplified diagram of the animation production pipeline. We call it the pipeline. And uh, I'm going to be referring to this uh, to kind of explain where my little rigging portion fits in. So just like a live action movie, we start with a script. Um, the script is written and rewritten and rewritten until it gets greenlit for production by the studio, until the studio thinks it's ready to go. Um, and this is the framework that's going to guide the entire production process. It takes us three or four years to make a movie, and um, it all kind of goes back to this initial script. While the script's being written and iterated upon, um, there's another department at work, the Visual Development Department, or VizDev Department. And in animation, um, we don't have the luxury of just going to the store and buying a prop we need. We actually have to build everything we need in the entire film, props, every cloud, every blade of grass, from scratch in the computer. And so we have this visual development team to sketch out and draw or paint or sculpt all of those props and all of those characters and all those things that we need in the film so that we can get our hundreds of artists all on the same page, so we all know that what we're building kind of fits with the vision of the director and um, fits with the story that we're trying to tell. 
so they'll do everything from um, things like these lighting keys. This is a painting to kind of establish what the mood is going to be like in this scene. It kind of shows what the lighting is going to look like. To um, prop sheets where, like I said, we're building absolutely everything from scratch. So they'll find reference photos, they'll draw pictures, they'll put together these sheets that give us all of the details of everything that we need um, to build for a particular shot or a particular part of the film. But the most uh, important art for character riggers are called character sheets. And this is uh, a piece of artwork that's going to give us a sense of the character's personality and how the director wants their body language to work, how their facial expressions should look. These are some of the original character sheets for Poe's body in Kung Fu Panda. And they kind of show the extreme kinds of poses and shapes that they want to get out of, out of Poe's character. So after kind of those initial development steps, then we kind of split into two different areas of production. Um, there's a whole bunch of departments that work on shots. And um, that means that they're going to be assigned some small portion of the movie. It could be a fraction of a second. It could be many seconds long. And they'll be adding their contributions to that, that portion of the film and then pass that shot down the pipe to further departments to add their contributions. Um, the first shot department is a storyboard department. And what they're going to do is they're going to take the script and look at one scene and draw it out to give us a sense of what that action is going to look like on screen, kind of your camera angles, what the character is going to be doing, and how it's going to be framed. At the same time that the storyboards are being drawn, we can bring in the voice actors. So the voice actors will have their voices recorded in a studio, and they'll be reading the dialogue from the script. And then we'll have the editorial department edit those two things together. So they'll take the storyboards and they'll put the um, voice track uh, underneath it, along with it. And this gives us the timing of how a shot's going to unfold. We'll know how long the shot is and kind of get a rough idea of, of how the character's action's going to play out. So then we get to the kind of bread and butter of of animated films, and that's the actual animation. Um, the animators will come in and actually create the performance in the shot. They'll match the dialogue that's been pre-recorded. They'll um, move this digital puppet around to create the action and the emotion that happens in that scene, kind of using those storyboards as a reference to know exactly how, how that action is going to play out. Um, we actually do all of our animation by hand. Everything that you see on screen in a DreamWorks film has been animated by hand. We don't use motion capture for anything that, um, that ends up in the finished film. And so this digital puppet that this animator is moving around, that's the rig. That's the rigging that I'm going to be talking about. Um, there's a lot more work that happens after that. I'm going to gloss right over it because I could talk about it for hours. But there's other teams that are going to do things like effects, water, smoke, dust, um, simulation of characters' clothing, simulation of dragon wings, um, lighting the shots so that they look either realistic or cartoony or however the mood of that scene wants to come across. Um, they really put the final polish on the film and make it look so incredibly breathtaking when you actually see it on the, on the, on the screen at the end. It all gets rendered out by a large bank of computers. Um, and then each of those frames get put together into what becomes the final film. But let's go back to the portion of the pipeline that I'm involved with, and that's the asset departments. So an asset is an element that's reused throughout the film, like characters or props or environments, especially those digital puppets I was talking about earlier. Um, so here are the asset departments. We'll start with modeling. So the modeling department is going to take the drawings that they got from the viz dev department, and they're going to look, um, look at how that character is supposed to be shaped, basically. They're going to sculpt this character inside the computer, and you'll end up with this model that's rigid and stiff, made up of thousands of points connected by um, these edges that turn it into this mesh, this 3D mesh inside the computer. 
It's usually um, in this kind of boring neutral pose. We call it the T pose because the character looks like the letter T. And, uh, and that's the modeling department's job. They sculpt this kind of neutral character that we're going to build into that digital puppet for the animators. Um, next, Surfacing will take that model and they add um, texture maps and color and reflection and transparency. They make things look shiny or dull or felty or hard or soft um, and really add that, that, extra, um, that extra look to the characters. And then we get to rigging. So um, rigging is going to enable that stiff, rigid model to move. We're the ones who bring that stiff model to life. So here's an animator working with the rig um, for O in the movie Home, and he's playing with uh, all these different controls that we've put into the rig that let him get different facial expressions for O. Um, yeah, so at DreamWorks, we actually split this rigging work um, into uh, body and face. We have different artists that specialize on either body rigging or facial rigging, and that's partially so that we can become experts at one or the other, and it's also partially because it speeds up the process. Um, it can take, for a, for a brand new hero main character on a movie, it can take us six months to get that character ready for animation. Um, and if we were doing the body and the face in sequence, it would take a year. So if we can work on them at the same time, that cuts our, cuts our work time in half. So the first thing the body rigger is going to do is they're going to start by looking at the model. And they're going to compare it to those character sheets we talked about earlier to get a sense of how much this character needs to move. Is it just a background character that just you know, moves a little bit and looks around and walks a little bit? Or does it need to be able to do kung fu? Um, those things require very different structures and very different um, sets of controls in the rigs. So. Um, We'll fit a skeleton inside the character. Um, that's kind of the first part to enabling it to move. The skeleton's made up of all of these joints, um, and the joints are points of articulation inside the character. They're places where that character is going to be able to bend or twist. Um, these skeletons actually come along with a set of controls um, that the animators can manipulate, and that set of controls can be in the hundreds for the body and for the face. Because often times we'll actually provide multiple controls to move the same part of the body, but in different ways. Um, let me give you an example of that. So let's look at those three joints on the character's left arm there. There's the, we call them up arm, low arm, and hand, but basically it's your shoulder, your elbow, and your wrist. And the joint structure in a character is a hierarchy, which means that each joint by default, we'll move all of the joints downstream from it. So if you rotate the shoulder, the elbow and the hand come along. If you rotate the elbow, the hand's going to come along. Um, and we call that forward kinematics. You're moving um, each joint and letting the rest of the joints that are underneath that joint in the hierarchy move along and come along for the ride. So this set of controls is great for doing things like arm swings, if the character's walking and swinging his arms. It's kind of natural that you'd start at the top and kind of work your way down the arm. But then there's also situations where the animator might want to have Poe pick up the stapler off the podium. And in that case, actually starting at the top and working your way down is going to be kind of tedious. You're going to rotate the shoulder and then rotate the elbow. And then, oh, the hand's not quite there yet. Let me rotate the elbow back. But now the shoulder's not where I want it. Let me push the shoulder. And so to try and get the hand to where you want it to go is kind of tedious and, and annoying. So um, in those cases, we have a separate set of controls called inverse kinematics. And what that does is it'll let you just take that hand and place it exactly where you want it to go. There's just a translation control right there on Poe's hand. And then the computer will automatically figure out what rotations need to be on the shoulder and the elbow to keep the arm from stretching and put the arm in kind of a natural position. So there are two different sets of controls, but they move the same joints. And um, that allows the animators the flexibility to use whatever controls make the most sense for whatever situation they're in, whatever kind of animation performance they're trying to get. 
Um, the system of, of skeleton and controls is what we call our motion system. And it's more on the analytical and kind of technical side of rigging. It requires a knowledge of math. Um, we need to know trigonometry and curves and matrices to be able to move and place these joints in 3D space. Um, we're taking these joints and sometimes we're translating them, sometimes we're rotating them, sometimes we're scaling them, making them bigger or smaller. And so we store all these little bits of math that do all this movement in blocks we call operators. And so like FK is one operator, IK is another operator. And we can string all these operators together into big graphs to do more complex actions. Like this is a chunk of, I think it's a chunk of the arm graph. But for example, um, I set up the motion system for Hiccup's peg leg on How to Train Your Dragon 2. Um, he has this prosthetic leg that kind of works like a, um, like a Swiss army knife. It's got all these little attachments that rotate and move and twist. And, and uh, it also needs to kind of compress when he walks on it and puts weight on it um, and all these other subtleties. So uh, it actually is made up of 19 joints, um, 235 operators. That's the graph for Hiccup's peg leg right there. Um, and we actually exposed 87 different animation controls to the animators to be able to get whatever nuanced, detailed motion they wanted to get out of that peg leg. So go back and watch the movie and see exactly how much that peg leg moves. <laughs> um, but that's kind of the level of complexity and detail that, that we're getting into in our rigs. We really want to give the animators the ultimate control to get whatever shapes and, and movement that they want to get out of the rigs. So, um, so yeah, somebody, uh, because the leg was kind of new, it was something we hadn't done before, um, I set up, sorry, the question was, did I just do the leg and then did somebody else do the arm and somebody else do you know, the other leg? Um, because the, the, um, the peg leg was something we hadn't done before, it was kind of like a new, um, a new challenge, a new problem to solve, we kind of, somebody had to pick that up and take that on, so that happened to be me, and then somebody else did the whole rest of the character because humans have um, kind of been done before, so we kind of know what we're doing there. Yeah. So we've got the skeleton that moves around and it's got controls that the animators can pull on. Um, but the next thing we need to do is we need to connect it to the skin. So that's the portion of rigging we call deformations. Um, we have a bunch of little building blocks, little um, operators like I showed on the motion side that we use for deformations. We call them deformers. And the simplest way to do it is to just have each of those little pink dots that's part of that skin mesh be connected to a joint or a bone in the character's um, skeleton. You can kind of see on Poe here, like all of these little green ones are all connecting points to the spine. And all these orange ones are connecting uh, kind of the points on the arm to the, to the arm bones. And points can be connected to multiple bones at the same time. So you can kind of blend off the, tr the transitions and things like shoulders and hips um, to, to make those shapes look good. So we kind of control these deformations with our, we have proprietary rigging software at the studio that the studio built and maintains. And we'll paint on the skin to determine the area of influence of the different joints. So like for example, this is the area that I want to be controlled by the, by the arm bones. So I'm gonna paint that and I can kind of fade off the, the influence into the hand and into the shoulder and then kind of move the arm around and see how it looks and how it bends and um, see if I'm getting the, the motion that I want and go back and tweak it. We have lots of other deformers um, that do things like puff up the skin for like cheek puffs or um, things that can stretch and relax the skin. We have deformers that'll uh, pinch the skin to create wrinkles, um, all sorts of different ways to kind of manipulate those points and move them around in space. So facial rigging is actually very similar to what we do on the body. Um, the main difference is that instead of really relying on that joint hierarchy, like that skeleton, um, we have joints that we put along the characters, what we call feature lines, different features of the face um, that are key in getting different facial expressions, like the nasal labial fold, that line that you get right there when you smile. Um, we call that the NLF. 
And so you can see those blue joints we have kind of right along that NLF. And those joints are sliding along an underlying surface to let the animators kind of get those, those smile shapes. But it's still just a system of joints, and the joints are moving the skin, and the joints have controls that the animators can, can wiggle around and play with. Um, but the facial expressions uh, tend to get a little more detailed than the body because we have to really worry about you know, wrinkles around the eyes and every little, um, every little detail in the face to make sure that we're getting the expressions that the animators and the directors are after. So a lot of people ask about how much anatomy you need to know to be a rigger. Um, it certainly helps. We're not experts, we didn't go to medical school, but, um, but it definitely helps in creating believable characters. So even fantasy characters that don't exist in the real world will try to find real world um, analogs to help us explain how the character should move and to create a character that audiences find to be somewhat believable and kind of just feels right because it feels like something you might have seen before. Um, this is just a sketch showing how we wanted this natter's tail um, to bend and they were actually kind of comparing it to this allosaur skeleton to figure out which parts were kind of stiffer and which parts were more muscular and which parts were bendy. Um, so we do, this, we do this a lot, actually, with most of our characters, we have some comparison. So the, the natter's wing flap, for example, um, we're kind of going back to looking at birds and seeing how bird wing motion happens. Toothless's wings are a little bit more stretchy and bat-like. He's got these big, long fingers and these big, stretchy membranes in his wings. Um, for the, the two-headed dragon, the sipple back, he's got these really long necks. So we're kind of looking at flamingos and how flamingos' heads stay still even as their body's flying. And then our buddy, the gronkle, this big fat guy, has these little tiny wings. And this is in slow motion, but uh, we looked at having that kind of figure eight wing beat pattern that you see in bumblebees or hummingbirds, trying to kind of replicate that on the dragons. Um, back at the beginning, this is from the original Shrek movie, um, we actually did build anatomical structures inside our characters. They made a skeleton that would kind of simulate what an ogre skeleton might look like, and they put muscles on top, and then they put skin and fat on top of that, and the skin on top of that, because um, they thought that that would be the best way to get kind of believable movement out of a character. Um, they did kind of similar things on the face to kind of build an ogre skull and see how the muscles and the ligaments might layer on top of each other and might move with facial animation. But when it, uh, when it comes down to it, we just realized that that's a lot, of, a lot of underlying structure that doesn't actually get seen on screen and it doesn't really help us all that much. Once we kind of understand how it should work, we can kind of fake it by just working on the skin itself and kind of understanding what musculature and what skeleton structure underneath um, would look like and how it would move. There are still um, a lot of special effects companies that do things like digital body doubles for Spider-Man and things like that. They actually will try to replicate that structure because um, it helps them a lot. But what we need at DreamWorks is to be more flexible because we're changing things all the time. And even way late in the process, the director might say, you know what, we need to make this character twice as tall, or we need to, this dragon needs another set of wings, or let's cut off Hiccup's leg. Um, and so we have to be able to change our rigs rather quickly to adapt to big story changes. And so having all of that underlying structure would make our work a lot harder to kind of be able to adapt and be flexible. Um, at DreamWorks last year, actually, they, they held this comparative anatomy course for us, which was amazing. We were trying to we had a bunch of movies in production that were going to have a lot of quadrupeds, um, a lot of characters with four legs. And so they wanted to kind of provide us with some information to kind of brush up on how different types of four-legged creatures move. And it was taught by, uh, this is Dr. Stuart Sumita. He's a paleontology professor at Cal State. He brought in a bunch of really big skeletons. It's a horse. Um, and he had a mountain lion and all sorts of big, cool skeletons to look at. And then also some of the um, animators at DreamWorks 
this is James Baxter, he's kind of a legendary animator, um, talked to us about how we could translate that real world anatomy to our cartoony characters like Marty the zebra here. Um, we looked at horses versus cats and kind of subtle differences in the way that their spines bend and how they um, perform different gaits like walks and trots and gallops and we looked at different um, these are different foot structures for different creatures, um, plantigrade feet like humans that are flat on the ground versus cats and dogs have digitigrade um, feet where they're kind of walking on their toes, and horses that are undulates um, that have those big long hoof bones and kind of, it was really neat to, to compare the skeletal structures of these different mammals that are actually very similar in terms of what bones are there, but what, um, kind of what uh, different tasks those bones perform are really different. Um, so it was a great way to kind of bring technical folks like Riggers, like myself, and the animators together to kind of brush up on, on some of this anatomy that we may never have known or learn more about, um, about these creatures. So speaking of quadrupeds, um, we do tend to kind of classify our characters to try and and uh, make it easier for us to understand what type of motion they're going to be performing. Um, bipeds are the simplest characters for us, really, because uh, we have mostly bipedal characters in our films. Even um, anything that walks on two feet is pretty much considered a biped. And we'll look at the storyboards to try and figure out um, what the character needs to do in the film and kind of how we would classify them. That means that even characters that aren't really bipeds in real life, like pandas and hippos, might be bipeds as far as the rig is concerned, because really, for the most part, Gloria is just walking around on her two feet and gesturing with her hands, even though she's a hippo. Um, yeah, even uh, Mr. Peabody and Peabody and Sherman, he's a dog, but he walks and talks like a human. Since we're trying to um, create these cartoony characters that are relatable and can, you know, emote and and tell a story, they tend to be very human-like in the way they actually move around. But of course, things get a little bit more complicated. Um, Alex the lion is what we lovingly refer to as a biquad, because he needs to be able to run on all four feet like a lion. Um, but he also needs to be able to get up and run around on his hind legs and gesture like a human. Um, with his biquad system, it's, it's really kind of a lot like that FKIK switch that I showed you earlier. We just kind of have a separate set of controls in his body that can help his legs move more like a quadruped when he needs to, and then um, a different set of controls that can move him more like a human when he needs to be a human. Um, and there's a bunch of other little subtle things that are kind of fun to look at when you watch this video, like when he's um, down on all fours, he actually has no thumbs. And when he gets up and walks around on a human, his thumbs appear. The directors didn't want him to have thumbs when he was a lion. I see no thumbs. And then, thumbs. <laughs> um, to keep him more lion-like, they wanted those to go away. Um, yeah, so that's bi-quads. And then things get even crazier. Not everybody's either a quadruped or a biped. Sometimes we have crazy creatures as well, um, or creatures with, with interesting and challenging features to them. Um, like Melman, the giraffe here, and uh, Toothless the dragon are mostly just our basic quadrupeds, but they also have, Toothless has those big wings, and Melman has this big, crazy angular neck. Um, we have snakes that need to be able to curl and, and jump and do kung fu. We have whole colonies of snails and armies of octopodes. And um, all of these rigs have their own sets of challenges. Um, but the, the most complicated character that we've ever done at DreamWorks that still holds the title to this day is Bob the Blob <laughs> from Monsters vs. Aliens. Um, this was a gelatinous nightmare. He, um, he uh, posed just about every challenge there is to rigging, and um, it took a team of riggers and effects artists working together 
like two years to get this rig up and running and ready for, for the film. In Bob's case, um, because he was doing such wacky movement in the storyboards, we actually had some animators do pencil tests, these uh, hand-drawn animation tests, to give us a sense of how they wanted Bob to be able to move and some of these wacky things that he does. Um, the scary thing about Bob is that he doesn't have a fixed shape. Usually we're working with this fixed model that we get from the modeling department and we can, all we have to do is worry about kind of moving those points around. That's a challenge in and of itself, but with Bob you can see sometimes he has arms, sometimes he doesn't have arms, sometimes he jumps and splits into two pieces, um, his eyeballs and his mouth can kind of slide around on his head, um, and he has these kind of gooey ripples that kind of propel him along the ground. So all of these things made it pretty clear early on that we weren't going to be able to get away with just our usual kind of pipeline, our usual model. So instead what we ended up with was the effects department helped us with this particle simulation. All those little blue dots um, kind of create Bob's volume and they'll get smoothed out and kind of turned into that blue goo that gets rendered by the computers at the end. So you can kind of see how this, the surface of Bob can change dynamically depending on whether he has arms or not or how those ripples kind of move along the ground. You see that triangulated mesh there that um, is kind of changing and adapting to whatever Bob's shape is at any given moment. And when we create crazy new characters with crazy new features like Bob, um, we also have to make sure that we're giving controls to the animators to enable them to activate these new features um, in ways that are user friendly to them and give them the flexibility that they need to create the performances that they need. So we've got these controls that let them control how that blobbiness happens, how far up it goes on Bob's body, how fast or slow it moves. Um, and then the animators can use those controls as their shots dictate that they need them. And the greatest thing about Bob was after all of this work, um, a lot of times the character will get cut or it'll only be in two shots or we, we, won't, we won't get to see all of that hard work up on the, on the screen in the end. But Bob actually was a huge part of Monsters vs. Aliens and we really got to see all of this hard work in action. So I've got this little, this little Bob demo reel to show you. Hi there! Ah! Ah, my back! Just kidding! I don't have a back! <laughs> Forgive him, but as you can see, he has no brain. Turns out you don't need one. Feel the wind on your antenna. Isn't this wonderful? I haven't been outside in 50 years. It's it's amazing out here. Who are you signaling? We're right here. Bob, could you, uh... Derek, you are a selfish jerk. And guess what? I've met someone else. She's lime green. She has 14 little chunks of pineapple inside of her. And she is everything I deserve in life. I'm happy now, Derek, without you. It's over. <laughs> so that's Bob. Um, so yeah, problem solving is a huge part of my job and some of the most fun parts of my job is, is trying to tackle these new and crazy things that we've never done before. Um, but DreamWorks actually has a problem solving problem and that is that we, um, up until a couple years ago, uh, worked on very separate teams for all of the different movies that we have in production. So even though, um, you know, at various points, we've had up to 85 riggers in the rigging department at DreamWorks, and we can be working on up to four films at a time. Uh, DreamWorks has been around for 22 years, so there's 22 years of, of legacy characters that we have to look at and reference. And there's, there's no central library or no global oversight to all of these different uh, films that were going on at once. The teams were really separate and really kind of focused on their own films. And what that meant is if you were starting a new movie and you had to rig a bird, you'd ask the person next to you, hey, have we ever rigged a bird here before? And they'd say, oh yeah, I think there was a bird on Shrek 2. 
And so they'd say, oh, okay, and they'd copy that bird from Shrek 2 and kind of start playing around with that and not know that there was a bird that somebody rigged more recently that was you know, way better and had all these great features that the animators loved. And, and it, it led to kind of a lot of duplicate work, a lot of people that solved the same problem multiple times for no good reason, um, and a lot of confusion with the animators because they'd get you know, two different bird rigs that have two different sets of controls that took them longer to get their job done. And so there's all this kind of inconsistency. So about four years ago, um, we started this group called the Character Technology Group. We call it Chartech. And uh, this was a team of senior riggers. There's five of us. And um, it's our job to kind of provide oversight and expertise to the rest of the department. So we partner with all of the productions that are going on at the studio. And we help kind of act as an information conduit to let them know what's going on and help them brainstorm their problems. Um, we have a pretty deep um, knowledge of what's been done at the studio before, so we can kind of give them good ideas of what's worked and what hasn't worked or point them to places where we may have solved these problems before. Um, and then we also maintain a set of templates and a central library for um, all of these different kind of pieces of characters that can be reused over and over again. So for example, um, you know, in the old days, if you needed a tail, you'd probably copy from some character that had a tail before and maybe add some new stuff to it. And then somebody else might copy that tail and add some new stuff to it. And you kind of end up with a tail that might have a lot of features. It might be kind of hard to use and complicated. It may be different than what the animator was used to on the last movie they worked on that had tails. And so it took longer to build this rig and it took longer for the animators to learn this new system. And so now we've got Chartech, whose job it is to maintain that tail package, we call them packages, and make sure that it has everything that the animators want. We kind of took a survey of, of a lot of the characters we had done in the past. We talked to the animators and, and asked them what was working for them or what wasn't working for them and tried to put together these, these building blocks that would now kind of become the gold standard at the studio and everybody would kind of be using the same approved body part. Um, another side effect of that is we can keep an eye out for not just the needs of one show, but the needs of all of the shows at once. So we can think about a tail system is really um, a set of controls that can be used to pose and shape something that's kind of long and skinny in some way, shape, or form. So that means it doesn't just have to be a tail. You could use a tail for a mustache. You could use a tail for peacock feathers. You could use a tail for troll hair or you know, for the core of, of Viper's body, um, even a rope bridge or a chain of monkeys hanging from a plane. Um, anything that is relatively long and flexible can kind of have the same underlying system, which is hugely helpful for the animators to jump in and know exactly what's going on. Um, octopi can be made up of just a whole bunch of tails. Um, if you look closely, actually, you'll notice that this octopus is really a uh, hexapus because he only has six legs. <laughs> um, turns out most people don't notice that it's missing two legs, and it's a lot faster to animate if you don't have to deal with two more legs. Um, well, they're, they're actually not even separate files. They're kind of chunks of code that live in a central library. And we have um, the, we've built tools kind of in our, in our software packages that you can open up the package tool and choose which uh, pieces you want and kind of click on that. And they get imported into your scene. And you can add them to your character that way. Um, that's a good question. So he's asking about whether the Chartech group was embraced by, by the team. Um, it, it was a bit of a PR struggle. Um, we had to, uh, that's our team right there. Um, there was, you know, obviously concern that people were losing autonomy and not getting to do those kinds of fun things that they did before. Um, but in all practicality, what it's, what it's ended up being, and I think the, the team has, um, embraced 
that they have support now. They have someone to go to to help them when they're doing these development projects. And we haven't taken away the development from them. We're just trying to help kind of guide it in a common, consistent way. Um, and what it's also done is for the people that don't really enjoy that part of the process, it, it lets them have an underlying structure that already works and is done, and they can spend the time on kind of finessing the deformations and doing kind of the more artistic parts of the job. Um, they don't have to spend all this time trying to get a character just up and running. We've got templates that kind of work right out of the box, so it lets them get to the fun stuff so faster. Like it better, more consistency of, uh, yeah, so the animators, the animators do appreciate the consistency. It was a bit of a, um, we had some growing pains in the beginning because anytime you're adding a new kind of level of oversight, there's a lot of, we had to get the animators to agree too. Because the animators before could just go straight to a rigger and say, hey, I want this new control on my tail. And now we kind of have to say, well, wait, let's see, does everybody want this new control or is it just you? Like, let's, let's kind of talk about what that means to kind of the studio as a whole. And we've had to involve more people in that conversation. But in the long run, um, in the long run, I think, you know, once we kind of have gotten used to the process, I think people see it more as, as having support and help and kind of all moving together in the same direction kind of unifies the group in that way. Um, so yeah, so now going forward, we're, we're working together with the teams on all the studios, all the um, movies in the studio. Um, Trolls and Boss Baby were the first two movies to kind of benefit from all of the new Chartech technology. And uh, we're also working now with the team on How to Train Your Dragon 3. And after two years in the Chartech team, I was the Chartech body lead for a while. Um, I got promoted to be the team supervisor, so that's what I'm doing now. So yeah, that kind of brings me back full circle here to OSU, where I was spending long nights in the computer lab at ACAD. Um, the reason I still love rigging is that it blends together these technical and artistic um, skills and really exercises my whole brain, I feel like. and. Working with a rig feels more tangible, even though it's inside the computer, you kind of feel like you're building this kind of contraption or this kind of robot that you can play with and move around. Um, but yeah, I've, uh, I, even with all of the years we've had at, at DreamWorks, we're still constantly problem solving and facing new challenges with every film, and even trying to improve on designs that we've made in the past and make them better and faster and more fun to use. And um, there just seems to be a never ending supply of challenges. So I hope you've enjoyed learning about my little niche in the computer animation world, and I'd be happy to answer any more questions you guys might have. Yeah, over here. That's a good question. So he was asking about uh, Tilt Brush and Oculus and how VR might be coming into animation. Um, we're not, we're kind of playing around and experimenting for sure, um, especially trying to see how we can put our characters into VR worlds and get that kind of uh, content out to audiences. Um, we're, uh, we're not to the point yet where we're actually integrating kind of VR processes into the making of the films yet, but I'm sure I'm sure we'll get there. We're always kind of dabbling in whatever's new and exciting to see if see how it can benefit us in the in the film industry. Do you think it might help that you might be able to actually walk around your character to see what the looks like without having to move your mouse around? Yeah, so um, I'm you know, I I'm sure it could it could make things it would definitely make things more interesting. I'm trying to think of you know, right now we have hundreds of, of artists all working at desks at computers, and we can, you know, inside the computer you can rotate the character around and see it from all angles. Doing it in VR would totally change that dynamic, so we'd have to see what the studio would look like if everybody's got VR goggles and how you would do your work. You'd have to have, like, a bigger space. But, yeah, I mean, it, it opens up a bunch of possibilities. It'd be really interesting to see how that could kind of change our, our perspective. All the way in the back. Um, the question is, does DreamWorks create their own software or do we use existing software? It's a little bit of both. Um, in the rigging department, we're using all proprietary software that we built ourselves. 
Um, we have our own R&D team of computer engineers that helps us build and, and maintain our own software. Um, but there are other departments, like modeling uses Maya and ZBrush, um, and uh, our character effects department that does like hair and clothing simulations, they're using Maya. So it kind of depends department to department. Um, when it makes sense, we have our own team that can build our own software. And uh, when we need to, when it's easier to use third-party software, we can do that too. We have a pipeline that can kind of help blend the two together so we keep assets and, and files moving along kind of in and out of various different software packages. Uh, how about right there? What was my favorite movie that I rigged so far? I really liked How to Train Your Dragon. I love the way the movie turned out, and I love um, all the crazy dragon creatures in there were really, really fun to work on. Right here. I'm sorry, do things that we figured out with them? Yeah, absolutely. So um, he's asking if if some of these specialized characters and, and systems that we build come up in later movies. Yeah, I mean, sometimes um, directly. I mean, How to Train Your Dragon 3 will have a hiccup in there again. Um, but a lot of times, even indirectly, the, the things that we kind of figure out will end up translating to other characters somewhere down the line. We haven't had any other. I don't think we've had any other particle-like characters like Bob since Bob. Um, but Pixar did something somewhat similar with their characters in Inside Out. They're all made up of little particles of light. Um, so it's, you know, kind of trailblazing those solutions tend to kind of keep popping up. Or at least you've got another tool in your arsenal, you know? So you, if you come across a problem like that in the future, you have some new ideas of how to solve it. Uh, how about down here? Yeah, so she's asking uh, how, how many things do we rig at the studio? Do we rig every tree and every blade of grass? Um, we focus mostly on characters and props. Um, basically, anything that has more than one point that has to move. Like, we don't rig a door, because the door just has like one rotation, um, like one point of rotation. Um, but anything that has more than that will do. Um, Things, a lot of things like trees and grass, especially if you've got like a, a big forest scene or a big scene on the savanna or something, those will actually go through the effects department because they'll create some simulation that can actually move all of the trees and all of the grass with wind and things like that that's kind of more automated and less hand animated. But any character or prop that's hand animated comes through us. I mean, sometimes, um, like I think Boss Baby ended up with several hundred assets they were working with, so many props and characters and background characters and vehicles and all that kind of stuff. Here. Um, so the question is, do the technologies we use here, are they being used at other studios? Um, no, we're actually very separate. So everything that we develop stays, stays in-house for the most part. Um, you know, there's a a yearly computer graphics conference where sometimes we'll present our work, um, write papers and, and kind of present certain solutions that we've had to problems and then other studios might try and build the same solution um, in their world. But for the most part, everything we build is, is in-house and kind of kept as proprietary information. Yeah, so the question is, if, if they make a TV show or a video game from one of our characters, do they use the same rigs? They'll re-rig it. Um, everything that we have stays inside the studio. And we're actually specifically building kind of high quality, high fidelity rigs that have an incredible amount of detail for what shows up on feature film screens. Um, for TV and for video games, they tend to be characters that are a lot lower res, a lot lower fidelity characters that just need to work quickly and, and they need to get something out. With video games, they need to work in real time, so they need characters that, that are really light and fast. Um, so yeah, we'll tend to, sometimes we'll pass the models 
to the teams that are that are building those other TV shows or video games, um, but the the character rigs themselves don't translate. Here. Oh, that's a good question. Um, so she's asking how much uh, do we influence kind of facial expressions and has that ever changed the script? Um, so we're always starting from art. We always go back to art. And the art department gives us sketches of, of most of the facial expressions that they want to get out of a character. Um, and we're really trying to target exactly what they've drawn. Um, but you know, they don't draw every expression of a character could possibly make. So we are trying to kind of fill in some of those gaps on our own. Um, there's definitely been times where a character, and I don't know if it, you know, if it's necessarily based on the rig, but um, when a character kind of steals the show and becomes becomes bigger than it was initially supposed to be, um, there's this, um, there's a, I don't know if you guys saw The Crudes, this movie about the cavemen. But there's this character um, in the Crudes that's a, a sloth that wear, that's worn around the character's waist as a belt. His name is Belt. And um, he re originally was just like a one-off gag in the movie that you know he goes to get something out of his belt and it's a sloth. But he became like so, so funny. Everybody found it so funny that they went back to the script and they kept adding more and more parts for Belt because everybody just found him so endearing. Um, so I don't know if I don't know if it would go back to the rig necessarily, but there's definitely been times when a character kind of um, kind of comes into its own and needs needs a bigger role in the film than we originally thought. Right there. Yeah. I'm wondering what uh, prompted you to go get your MFA instead of starting trying to start your career after you had your bachelor's. Yeah. So um, after my bachelor's degree, I I had I had kind of dabbled in a lot of different. Um, technology uh, around video and music and animation and um, but I, I was kind of spread pretty thin and I knew that going to if I wanted to go to a big studio like DreamWorks or Pixar I'd need to s specialize and have a demo reel that would show skills in, in one particular area and I didn't have that yet I also didn't didn't really um, I understood the animation process but I didn't really get my hands on each part of the process um, coming out of undergrad, so I wanted to get into an MFA program where I could really focus on animation and really find my niche there. And so that's kind of what brought me here was to, to get more in depth into animation and figure out where I fit in. Yeah, absolutely. So the fields of study to go into computer animation, there's jobs in computer animation that range from really technical to really artistic to kind of right smack in the middle. Mine's kind of in the middle. Um, but I would say, depending on where your areas of interest and where your skill level is, you could focus on computer science, computer engineering, programming, um, or fine arts and you know dig into being a fine artist, but one way or another, um, the more you can do to find programs that let you collaborate with with people on the other end of the spectrum, the more you'll be able to um, kind of work in that kind of collaborative, interdisciplinary kind of field. So most of the students that we see coming um, coming to DreamWorks these days, there are a lot of colleges that are doing computer animation um, degrees, programs. Um, and I guess I would just make sure that like, not only you're learning Maya or whatever computer animation software um, they're teaching there, but also that you are doing group projects and working with people and being able to show kind of a, a depth of, of skill outside of just using the software. Like we wanna see drawings and we wanna see um, paintings or if you're more technical, we wanna see your code, we wanna see what you've programmed. So not just learning how to use the software, but having a, a deep base of knowledge in computer science or, or art. Back there. How did I get hired at DreamWorks? 
and what was the process like? Um, I got off really easy because DreamWorks came here and was scouting students here. So um, I, I interviewed with um, their outreach um, their outreach people when they came here to ACAD. And then I had a phone interview with a rigger that was working at DreamWorks at the time. And from there, they got me an internship. And because I was there for a summer and got to kind of show them what I was capable of and show them my skills, then that turned, turned into the full-time job. Um, for most people applying to, to jobs at DreamWorks, um, it's kind of a full-day interview process. They'll bring you on campus or remotely interview with several different teams of, um, of artists at the studio and managers at the studio. And it's kind of like a whole day grilling process. And they'll want to see, um, they will always want to see your demo reel, which is like a two or three minute movie that you make kind of showing off all of the work that you've done and your skill set. So yeah, I've, I consider myself getting off really easy <laughs> as far as the interview process goes. Over here. Yeah, so she's asking about when you recognize voice talent and you can kind of see some of their mannerisms in the animation, kind of how does that work and where does that come from? So um, when the actors record in the, in the studio, they'll often be, you know, we need their audio, we need their voice, but they'll also be video recorded as well. And so um, the animators will use that as reference a lot of the times. So they'll get to see the actor's performance um, and sometimes translate that to the way that the character moves and talks too. Um, and usually when we're starting development on a movie, uh, they'll have certain actors in mind to play certain characters. So that also might influence the way those characters are designed and, and drawn, because they're probably you know, thinking about Seth Rogen while they're drawing Bob or whatever and kind of using that as influence. Right here. The hardest part of making an animated movie. Um, Let's see. Really, for me, the hardest part is, is probably getting used to changing things all the time, because the target keeps moving. Like, we'll, we'll start with a character that we think we know what he's supposed to do. Like, oh, this is just guy number 47, and he's going to stand in the back, and all he has to do is be in this crowd and kind of wave or something. And then the actor or the director will be looking at a shot and say, oh, Man 47, can we bring him forward? And he needs to say these three lines and we're gonna put a police outfit on him. So you're like, okay, so now this guy that I didn't think we needed um, to be, you know, to look great is now gonna be front and center. And so now we have to, you know, adapt to that. Or, um, or like I said, characters get cut all the time and it's heartbreaking. You spend all of this time working on this character and then they're just like, yeah, you know what? It's not really working. We're just gonna cut him. and. Um, my favorite example of that is in Madagascar 2, um, there was this whole, um, Marty the zebra was supposed to meet a whole herd of zebras and they decided that it would, so we rigged all these zebras, we had all these ver variants of different male and female tall short zebras and then they said, you know, you know what would be really funny? If all the zebras look exactly like Marty. So we'll just use a hundred copies of Marty and we said, great. Thanks. <laughs> and so all that got tossed out. And it was funny, but you know, that was a lot of work. So yeah, I mean, I would say for me, the hardest, the hardest part is, is just, you know, kind of understanding that we're all here to serve this purpose of telling the story and, and the storytelling process kind of changes and it's pretty fluid. So we've got to be able to, to kind of roll with those punches. Yeah. So he's asking. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So he's asking um, how close we are to be able to um, to like approach like photo real characters and, and animation that looks like a real person. I you know honestly, if somebody had the budget, I'd say we're there. I, we can do it. I, you'd be probably surprised at how much you see on screen in live action movies that isn't real. Um, there's you know, there's a ton that goes on in, in 
live action movies that you think is a stunt double, or you think is a guy in a suit, and it's, and it's all digital and you just never knew. We just don't have the budget. Um, movies don't generally have the budget to do an entire movie like that. Yeah, right? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think we are to the point where, where you could probably slip digital characters in and people wouldn't know the difference. Um, it's just, yeah, it's just expensive. I mean, movies like the Avengers movies have 2,000 special effects shots. Like, shots you wouldn't even think have special effects are, are actually digital in a lot of cases. Yeah, back there? Yeah, like how do we find out um, what the new movie is that we're going to be working on? Um, so usually before the uh, the rest of the studio knows about it, we've got a you know a team of we've got a bunch of story artists that are kind of working on a bunch of stories at once. So we'll sometimes hear like, oh, we got the rights to this book, or we got you know the rights to Trolls. When we when we learned we were working on Trolls, we we got the licensing rights to make a movie about the toy. Trolls, and so we'll kind of get announcements at the studio that we kind of acquire the rights to these different properties. Or sometimes we'll um, we'll hear that we're developing some story internally um, that that uh, you know some artist or director came up with. And so there's always kind of a bunch of things incubating at any given time. And then the studio will make kind of an official announcement when they feel like they're ready for one of those movies to go into production and actually be greenlit and funded and have a release date, there's usually a, a big announcement at the studio. And it's usually right about the same time that they, they'll do a press release to the public.